future of food in space. With Lenore Newman and Evan Frazier. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we look at the future of food in space. We're going to discuss how people have answered and continue to refine the challenges of eating in habitations away from our home world. Later in the show, we're going to talk with Lenore Newman and Evan Frazier, authors of Dinner on Mars. The technologies that will feed the red planet and transform agriculture on Earth. Not surprisingly, the first food in space was eaten by the first person to venture beyond Earth, Yuri Gagarin, during his maiden flight in 1961. Cuisine on the mission consisted of beef and liver paste packed like toothpaste in a metal tube. These early experiments in spaceborne dining, including later flights by John Glenn as well as Valentina Tereshkova, proved human beings could consume edibles in microgravity. The Gemini program of 1965 and 66 saw the first freeze-dried food aboard flights. Now, one of the goals of the Gemini 3 flight was to explore how humans reacted to food in microgravity environments. The two astronauts, Gus Grissom and John Young, were packed into their spacecraft with dehydrated meals for the four-hour flight. The four-hour flight! What NASA did not know at the time! is that Young smuggled forbidden cargo onto the spacecraft, a corned beef sandwich. It seemed like a good idea at the time, and wasn't. Crumbs tumbled through the air in the, the, air in the capsule, threatening electronics. This experiment in spaceborne sandwiches lasted for just a single bite before Young pocketed the remains. Astronauts aboard the Apollo missions could get the first hot meals away from Earth, adding hot water to freeze-dried foods. This advance led to soups and the all-important coffee. There would be no serious chance of becoming an interplanetary species without coffee. Now, food cubes became a thing, and the first food eaten on the moon was a cube of bacon. By the time the space shuttle was in service, spoon bowl packaging allowed space travelers to eat hot foods using a small spoon poked into a bag. These packages included meals like spaghetti with sauce or stews that stick to the container, preventing wayward food from, from tumbling through the cabin. Now, salt and pepper are served in liquid form, preventing tiny particles from floating away. The first flight of the space shuttle, incidentally, was commanded by John Young. Yeah, the corned beef sandwich guy. Now, NASA obviously forgave him his clandestine repast. Next up, we're going to talk about the future of food in space with Lenore Newman and Evan Frazier, authors of Dinner on Mars. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Lenore Newman. She is the Director of Food and Agricultural Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley, as well as Ev Evan Fraser. He is Director of the Arrow Food Institute at the University of Guelph. And they've written a new book, which is going to look something like this, Dinner on Mars. And that's coming out on the 27th of October. Welcome to the show, both of you. Really good to be here. Yeah, right. delighted, James. Thank you. Yeah. And so first, I'd like to get a little look at a little story from both of you about how you, how, how you came to write this book, what inspired it. 
That is a great question. And it definitely was a bit of a inspiration to deal with difficult times in that both Evan and I travel extensively in our work all around the world, looking at food and agricultural systems. And when the COVID pandemic began, we found ourselves grounded. And we realized, given that we couldn't do field work, we had to find a project. And so the idea arose that, well, we can't go anywhere. We might as well research somewhere that we really can't go yet. And we started to ask ourselves, what would a food system look like on Mars. And I'm going to toss it over to Evan. Evan, anything to sort of add to how that idea sort of evolved then from a random comment to a book? <laughs> the best well, books start with random comments. <laughs> I mean, thousands and thousands of texts back and forth in March and April of 2020 as we were both sort of navigating around piles of toilet paper and canvas <laughs> in, our, in our respective homes. You're the ones who had it all. <laughs> 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 and uh so um one of the things i love about the book is just the way you folks think totally outside the box and one of the things i loved was talking about cyanobacteria <laughs> yeah you know typically mislabeled blue green algae this stuff is fascinating scientifically absolutely disgusting to look at <laughs> and provide some environmental hazard a lot of environmental hazards but you talk about it being a being an important step towards developing foods in space habitations of the future how does that go about how, how do we get our algae patties yeah. Do you want me to jump on that one, Lenore? <laughs> so, I mean, this is this is a funny one because, I mean, I grew up on a farm or part, you know, spent summers on my grandparents' farm not far from Lake Erie that has mm. really bad problems of cyanobacterial blooms many summers uh, that are are polluting the polluting the lake and and are running off our agricultural fields. So the idea that cyanobacteria can and should be the basis of a food system in, initially struck me as kind of crazy. I'm not going to lie. But but as I got <laughs> researching, and, and I took the lead on researching this chapter, uh, um, as we as I got researching this, this thing, it became really evident to me that one of the things you're going to need to do on Mars is create a source of organic molecules uh, as the basis for other things. And cyanobacteria actually has the ability to digest um, all the sort of ingredients that you'd find both in the Martian atmosphere and in the Martian regolith, the what you know, Martian sand or Martian soil, if you want to call it, Martian regolith, uh, cyanobacteria could actually digest those and produce organic molecules and uh, at, at the same time. So really, I think you need a microorganism like that one to sit at the basis of a food system on which you would then build the, the things that you would actually eat because i don't think that many people would want to live for the rest of their lives uh on on algae patties but algae patties will probably feature somewhere in the diet <laughs> <laughs> lenore <laughs> lenore would you yeah. eat an algae patty be, be well, I, guess, <laughs> I guess if i'm gonna be if i was on mars i'd sort of have to and uh, <laughs> you know i think it um it does go to show that uh, we're doing this, building a food system from scratch in an environment where you don't have the Earth's ecosystems to sort of use as a cheat of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to think a bit outside the box and really start at that base level. And that became very clear. Hmm. Hmm. And so what are some of the techniques and that we are looking at now for going in, growing food in space that could help benefit farmers and people here on Earth with our, with our current challenges? Yeah, well, if I could jump in just to mm. start. Um, part of my work and part of the, the writing that uh, I led for the book was around uh, creating protein using alternative pathways, such as using precision fermentation of yeasts and bacteria or cell cultures. And the reason this became so critical, and it's once again, as, as with heaven, um, I also was born into the food system. My family ran a fishing company. And the more we looked at it, we realized that uh, 
really animal agriculture in space doesn't work. <laughs> and <laughs> it's really clear. And I mean, that has implications on Earth as well. We know that animal agriculture uses really a lot of resources, which is why there is such push to diversify into plant-based and cell-based proteins. So it became clear very quickly that if uh, we were going to have dairy products on Mars, we would be using yeast instead of a cow or a bacteria instead of a cow, using precision fermentation. And we also started to realize if we were going to have a hamburger on Mars, it probably would be cultivated, um, cultured in a in a lab setting in a vat, much as uh, is being done here on Earth right now. And so I really see those technologies as critical to that food system. Um, and I think the one other thing I would add before I toss over to Evan, the other thing that became clear is we would just, a Martian city would have plants everywhere and they would be critical to the functioning of the entire city um, and to the food system because they, along with the algae, they're just the base. They're the base of everything, including a lot of the closing of loops. But Evan, maybe I'll ask you a bit more about, pass that over to you for some of that closed loop thought that we fell into very quickly. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, just to link this back to the, the discussion on cyanobacteria, I mean, you know, cyanobacteria is you know, probably going to eat some of that stuff. But really what you're going to do is you're going to use the cyanobacteria that grows on the Martian ingredients and actually convert it into higher value products. So whether you use the cyanobacteria essentially as a uh, as a fertilizer for growing plants, like like Lenore just said, or you could feed it into a bioreactor that then converts that cyanobacteria into, say, uh, a, a, a manufactured whey protein, and then you'd turn that into a milkshake. I mean, these are the sort of ways that we're sort of imagining how you would start with the basic ingredients, uh, like a cyanobacteria, and upcycle, and not recycle, you would upcycle into higher value products where waste at each stage then becomes an input to some other stage. So if, a, if, if, if the waste product out of a cyanobacteria tank is all this dead bacterial organism, then that would be then fed to another tank that would then turn it into, say, a whey protein. And then humans would eat that whey protein. And, and on it goes. And, and, and really what we're talking about here is a closed loop system with no waste where where every psych every element of the cycle produces inputs into another part of the cycle and humans are part of those cycles and that's and that's really where we aren't actually talking about mars anymore we're talking about here on earth because really the industrial food system that nourishes all of us or pretty much all of us on the planet today doesn't use those cycles it, it takes ingredients from the natural environment it turns them into stuff we eat and then we produce all this waste and we waste a lot of food. So, so really what we're talking about is the thought experiment of going to Mars really gives us a template on how to actually save Earth. And that's really, <laughs> when, you get, when you get away from the hyperbole and the sort of the imaginativeness of the thought experiment, that's really what this book's about. Hmm. And as you mentioned, you know, this is perfect because, you know, we are reaching the point where probably at the end of this year or the beginning of next year, we're going to hit 8 billion people. So yep. how do we, we realistically provide enough sustenance for and get it out to everyone who needs it? Yeah, so well, we need we need I'll jump and then I'll pass to you, Lenore. We need to radically shrink the number amount of land that agriculture uses. Uh, and as we increase the amount of food that people eat, uh, we need to reduce not just the land, but also the energy and the fertilizer inputs to produce that food. So we need to do agriculture far more efficiently uh, in terms of its inputs than we have before. And, and really, the, the thought experiment of going to Mars is our way of working through some of the technologies that will make us as efficient as theoretically possible. And when you go through this experiment, thought experiment, at least the conclusion I came to is the technologies to feed 9 billion people later this century on planet Earth are not very far away. I mean, it's not super futuristic technologies that we need. So the, the technological tools are within grasp to feed Earth in a sustainable way. Um, and, and we unlock those by perhaps thinking about space. But anyhow, Lenore, go for it. Yeah, so I think that's really true. And uh, along with that efficiency, one of the things that became clear is you end up with a system that is both local but very intensive and uh really my in my day job 
this has been emerging as well in that uh, British Columbia in Canada has come through a period of incredible uh, weather disruption thanks to climate change, including uh, serious floods that cut us off from the rest of North America last winter. And aside from doing billions of dollars in damage, we ran short of food because we couldn't get it in, including with uh, greens and lettuce. And uh, since then, we've really realized that, wow, we need to be producing food closer to market year round intensively. And really, that's in many ways the problem you're trying to solve in a Martian city. And I mean, the other thing I will add is we we also realized what a hard problem it is as we did it. And I, I do think that if Elon Musk wants to build a city of 100,000 people on Mars, he'd better have some food scientists working on this problem. Or, or they uh, they are poised to be very hungry if they uh, treat food as a bit of a one-off. And uh, I mean, I don't say that lightly either, because I think we all do that a little bit. We all ignore food until it's a problem. And of course, right now, because we have a lot of inflation, food's really expensive, we're all paying attention. And we really need to, because it's critically important to our civilizations that that supply of food flows. And I think doing this thought exercise on Mars really does demonstrate that, um, you know, it's... Uh, we need to be putting more thought into these systems. Hmm. And it seems like the in order to make the first, let's say, uh, habitations on the moon, NASA just announced, um, you know, some of the spots they're looking at for the first habitations on the moon as well as on Mars. Um, they're almost going to have to run like smart cities, aren't they? And food cycles and recycling is is a vital part of that. Can you talk a little bit about how smart city design is influencing your thoughts and vice versa? Sure. I mean, this sort of gets back to what we were talking about a few few minutes ago about this idea of cycles and that nature works in tidy cycles. Leaf falls on the ground decomposes, picked up and turned into more leaves. Um, whereas the industrial food systems that we've got or the industrial economy really doesn't do th those cycles. And, and a big part of smart cities uh, it, when it comes to food is to use advanced technologies, artificial intelligence, um, et cetera, sensorics in order to create circular economies of food. So I'm, I'm part of a, a the steering committee of a large Canadian funded smart cities initiative that's using data and data driven techniques, artificial intelligence and sensorics in particular, in order to identify where within the region there are sources of waste and what they are and where they're produced and when they're produced mm -hmm. in the day and link those up in, in a smart way with industries that need them. So in, in the book, we go through an example where, where the waste from a brewery gets utilized by a bug farm and the bugs get fed to fish and the effluent from the fish gets put on a potato on a potato field and all of this stuff comes together in a fish and chips meal and a pint of beer at a local pub <laughs> and, and 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 that's a it's a wonderful metaphor of how a region at sufficient scale can have all these efficient businesses that with technology can be linked together to create that circularity and so that's how we've conceptualized smart sit think smart cities thinking and it's that that will absolutely be the mantra that'll be the dna of anything we do off this planet so fascinating and finally um what is next for both of you are you what do you, what's your next project <laughs> Oh, that's uh, well. We're uh, we're always working on something, and right now we're uh, we're we did get we didn't intend when we started out on this project that it would have such a strong statement for food on Earth. I mean, that's our day job. We were kind of doing this just as a thought experience, but we had the more we did, the more we realized there is a new food system emerging that is highly technological, but also very environmentally grounded, very close loop. Um, we're looking now at, at fleshing that out a bit, at actually plotting that revolution and what is pushing it forward and also what's standing in its way to a degree. And um, Evan, um, maybe I'll, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, 
I mean, a really tangible next step for both of us is that, and this is moving more into an academic realm, but if any of your listeners are, are more, sci- you know, hardcore science, we're, we're in the process of editing uh, what I'm going to say is the world's first textbook on cellular agriculture. That's the idea of producing uh, animal proteins in laboratory-like settings. And, uh, and, and you know, there's two chapters in Dinner on Mars on cellular agriculture, one focusing on sort of meat and one focusing more on dairy. Um, but we got so curious about this and we realized in researching it that there wasn't a good academic textbook that summarized the state of the science of that. So, um, like any good entrepreneurs, uh, we said, well, if the textbook on cellular agriculture doesn't exist, maybe we should write it. And so we've now got 35, uh, groups of scientists from around the world contributing and, um, I have just finished my review of draft one. Lenora is still working on draft, her review of draft <laughs> one, but, 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 you know, about this time next year, um, a book, an academic book called uh, The Fundamentals of Cellular Agriculture, Science and Society will, will be hitting the press, the academic presses. That's great. Well, thank you so much both for being on the show. It was fabulous talking with you. Oh, it's lovely to, uh, lovely to join you. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah, thanks very much. This is great. Yeah, fabulous. And that was uh, Lenore Newman from the University of Fraser Valley and Evan Fraser from the University of Guelph. Picky eaters are out of luck aboard the ISS as there is no food waste allowed aboard the space station. Diners must finish their plates or pouches, as the case may be. This prevents buildup of smelly garbage, definitely a no-no in close-knit quarters. Am I right? So, one one change which happens to the human body in space is faces grow more rounded in low-gravity environments, resulting in congestion. This reduces the taste of foods, driving astronauts to crave spicy, sour, bitter, and salty foods. We might therefore expect food to become more flavorful as the human race expands into space. Pre-packaged foods can deliver nutrients needed for good health to travelers near the Earth. However, these nutrients break down over time, requiring long-term inhabitants of space to grow their own crops. New research has shown that crops can grow at at least to some extent, in the regolith or surface material of the moon. In 2011, the novel The Martian, from Andy Weir, told the story of astronaut astronaut Mark Watney caught on Mars. His makeshift diet was weighted heavily toward the potatoes. potatoes. The real-life residents of outer space will certainly enjoy a more varied diet. Cooking methods will evolve over time, but many of the techniques used by chefs today on Earth, including sautéing, or tossing food from a pan into the air, as well as the open flames of flambéing, seem like really terrible ideas in space kitchens. Am I right? Ironically, science and technology are likely to result in an increase in the percentage of people farming. Populations in space will also likely enjoy a vegan diet. Uh, First cities on the moon and Mars will not have the resources needed to support meat production. The effects of universal veganism, both in terms of health as well as society, remains to be seen. Join us next week on The Cosmic Companion as we talk about making space flight sustainable. We'll discuss ways we can move out into the cosmos with an eye on the environment of Earth and beyond. We'll be talking with Daniel Bach, CEO and co-founder at Morpheus Space. Join us starting on the 20th of September. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please download, follow, and share the show with your friends, family, and pets. Especially pets. This is Max. Isn't he cute? Clear skies. (laughs) 